Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So in the interest of time, I'm going to start this session. Um, and uh, we've got a, a full house. There were moments when I wasn't sure whether it would just be me and a dog doing the session because everybody was getting stuck in places, the French air traffic controllers and trains were on strike and everything was going wrong. But they bravely fought through. So we've got a starry cast here. We've got Professor Battaglia from Varese, Professor Herman from uh, Paris in France, Professor Holtzman from uh, Switzerland, from um, uh, Turkey we have Chem Meko, and from Malaysia we have Prepa and Ariyan, and we have Jami Karin um, from India. So we have a really fabulous uh, group of people who are going to discuss, and I mean that in the friendliest way, um, this uh, uh, set of questions and uh, discussion points on a particularly rare problem, actually, um, as we well know. So if we could just uh, advance the slides. I'm not sure if we could move on to my presentation. Gentlemen in the box. I once had this happen at the Royal College of Surgeons as nothing was happening. I kept saying, things not working, things not, no, no but nothing happened. So in the end, I said, I, I don't often say this, but I need a man and I need him now. And the whole audience burst into laughter and the men in the box actually realized, thank you. So onto the side of the <laughs> round table. <laughs> okay, I think my buttons probably seem better days here. Um, I'm pressing the next button and nothing is happening. And again, I'm going to have to say next if this carries on. Can one of the uh, IT people rush forwards with a, something that allows me to... Hey, right. Okay, hurrah. So, we're talking about a very rare condition. It's very, very difficult with these tumours to get large numbers of cases. And certainly, uh, we know that they... Um, generally, apart from melanoma, are probably getting a little bit rarer, actually. They're very diverse in their histologies, they all have different natural histories, and they often present late. So they're a difficult problem to deal with. And certainly back in 2010, uh, some of the panelists and indeed um, uh, some people in the audience were part of this um, group that we put together to produce a supplement just to kind of put a, a baseline down to look at what was available in the literature that would help us and guide us and compare what was happening with endoscopic surgery with other uh, treatments. Um, since that time, there has been what can only say a proliferation of books on how to do it, all the things you might want to know to do endoscopic skull-based surgery. Um, and many people are very interested and indeed very expert at doing it. Um, but we can't get over the fact that um, there are some fundamental differences between endoscopic approaches and some of the previous uh, operations. And one of the big positive things about craniofacial resection was that you could do an on-block resection. So my question to the audience, uh, to the panelists, as a nice gentle opener, is do you think an on-block resection is necessary for malignant sinonasal tumors? David. <laughs> I think this is a, a matter of debate, but up to present, the data, the data does not show that, that it is really evident that we have to go for a non-block resection. Okay. Another discussion is in sarcoma. Hmm. Y yes. <laughs> Another discussion is in sarcoma. <laughs> Do you want to pursue that discussion point, or should we ask your colleagues? Well, if, <laughs> first, first the colleagues. Is there any, does anybody disagree with David that uh, it's no longer necessary to do an on-block resection? Any comments? Uh, the the un underlying point is, do we have chance to seed tumor when we resect it uh, partially, uh, um, uh, piece, piecemeal? And uh, there's... I think hardly no proof concerning ETAC, uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, or even SCC, but globally the prognosis is sarcoma is so poor that, as stated uh, David Holtzman, then maybe here we should be cautious, especially if we're dealing with high-grade sarcomas. Uh, 
of course, let's see. Okay, so you've opened the debate about the sarcoma. Is there any other comments about sarcoma then? I think um, I spoke with, uh, for example, some guys that did the craniofacial resection, but also with the craniofacial resection in some intestinal type of adenocarcinoma pushing on the orbit, the end block resection was not uh, uh, mm, mm, possible. So I think the main uh, um, goal is the, the free margins, not the end block. Uh, and uh, the main publication in literature from Brescia Varese from uh, United States demonstrate the result are almost the same with the Pismiller resection and then block resection. So now with this, I think this concept has been overcome. Yeah, well, I, I would entirely agree with you. And I mean, I think what we've seen over the last um, decades or so is a sort of complete sea change in our approach to oncologic resection, not just in the nose, but also in the larynx, pharynx with transoral uh, laser resections and um, I mean it was once a, a terrible uh, anathema people would shout at meetings and punch each other over it but you know no longer I think as you say your point is very well made it's free margins rather than on block as long as you get it out it doesn't really matter the methodology um, but the, the term that I really get very crossover is when the, particularly my radiotherapy colleagues, dare to suggest that we're debulking, because that is not generally our concept when we're trying to do curative resection. Okay, so let's then move on to what is the best re repair technique. Now, that's a very sort of broad, open question, and clearly the panelists will say it's, it depends on the situation. Um, I mean, we know that when craniofacials were done, there were a variety of things that we used, uh, including pericranial flaps and free flaps, but um, fascia lata was in many ways the sort of workhorse of quite large uh, skull base defects in the anterior part of the anterior skull base. And when it came to CSF repairs, we, we know in the literature that there's just about anything can be used um, and that indeed uh, the repair results are extremely good um, for primary repair um, in over 90% in many of the larger studies. Um, but, of course, we recognize that as skull-based surgery has advanced, both in its uh, um, broadest sense, but also in its physical sense, into the clival region, um, clearly there have been issues with the repairs, and uh, thus the rise of the pedicle septal flaps. So my question to the panel, then, is... When do you use the pedicle septal flaps? Do you use them for every skull base repair you do, or do you reserve them for certain circumstances? Perhaps, Chen, we can start at the end of the panel. Well, to talking on malignancy, uh, we are trying to use actually only the facial lata when possible uh, because of the... Um, I mean, how, how bright is the tumor in the nasal cavity? We would not like to, you know, uh, introduce a new tumor, as perhaps a second primary, uh, from another location from the, in the nose to the resection area that we uh, bring. So uh, we pretty much have good results with the uh, fascia lata, or uh, if that would not be adequate, one can also still use the pericranial flap uh, through a draft tree opening and introducing it uh, uh, if one really wants to like uh, uh, vascularized uh, tissue in the same region, this is also doable. Jenny Karam, please. Yeah, I, I uh, have to uh, put in a few points. Number one is we don't use cartilage or bone if the patient is going to undergo a radiotherapy postoperatively. This is point number one. Point number two, uh, we generally uh, assess the amount of septum which is left behind uh, because we don't want the tumor margin to be compromised on. So, but we prefer to use a pedicle vascularized flap for large defects. If it's going to be a small defect, then maybe we will plan for a facial lata or, uh, but it's always multi-layer and uh, it's, uh, it's most probably a pedicle vascularized flap. Either uh, uh, extended hadad or a lateral nasal wall flap or a pericranial flap. For the clivus, it's the temporoparietal flap. 
so that's... Okay. Yes, please. Just a, a word about the, the two uh, issues. You can repair with whatever technique. I think in the good teams, with fascia or with flaps, in anterior skull base, which is low pressure kind of leak, you, you, you manage a fair rate of success. But the problem behind is that uh, for quality of life, you will get less crusting if you have a vascularized flap. So the problem is not to compromise the margin, but if ever you have the chance to spare a septal flap, it will be much more comfortable. So usually this issue will be on a limited olfactory neuroblastoma, or on some cases of ETAC, where you judge that the contralateral side is perfectly uh, free of, of, of tumor. But the second issue is radiotherapy, because it depends how aggressive your radiotherapist is, whether he would limit himself to 60 gray or go a little bit further. And I can tell you, we've published about this, above 60 without vascularized flaps, we got some issues with delayed radionecrosis of the brain that we needed to cover without leak, but with obviously something which is not uh, a fair condition for in, in terms of inflammation and reaction of the brain. Pepper, any comments? The problem with scalbis malignancies is the majority of the time, there's not much of a septum left behind. If you want a, a tumor-free margin, especially if you want at least a 0.5 to 1 centimeter, if possible, you will not have a septal flap at all. So most of the time, what we are left with is fasciolata. The technique does not make a difference. As long as we get a watertight closure, it doesn't make a difference. So in very rare cases, when the septum is not involved, only then we can use a septal flap. Otherwise, it's the pathology itself holds out the septal flap. Dave, David, you wanted to make a comment? Well, uh, I principally agree to my colleagues, and I can say this is also our experience, and I just want to add one thing. The flap has sometimes the advantage that you can reuse it. So if you have to come back, for instance, any kind of recurrence, sometimes you can reuse the flap. That's a big advantage. But I would like to stress that the flap still has its side effects, as has been outlined in several publications. Also, we had a, a study on that. Let's say pro prolonged crossings and all the different things that have, I do not want to go into details. I would also add that the high flow leak, so when you are expecting, for instance, towards the third ventricle in craniopharyngioma, then the flap is really helpful and we have less uh, CSF leaks thereafter. So, um, I mean, all, often I've, I've sort of thought about this, sort of the oncologic issues that um, Chem uh, raised. Um, and, you know, clearly, as uh, I think Philippe said, you know, if you've got an adenocarcinoma, you feel in, in your bones that there may be some widespread field change. Uh, interesting, I don't know if Mark Yorison's in the audience, but Mark has uh, done quite a big study of his adenocarcinoma, it's quite a big group, and has actually not found there to be uh, very much evidence for new cancers occurring on the contralateral side. Um, any, any sort of comments on that? I mean, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you, my, my own position is that if it's on the anterior part of the anterior, in other words, as you say, a low pressure leak, I'm perfectly happy um, using either temporalis fascia or fasciolata for, depending on the size, plus inferior turbinate mucosa, because then I feel, well, it's away from the likely source of the tumor. But I'd be very interested in, in your comments on this business of field change, because it's in intuitive, but is it true? Paolo, you're, you're you can say about our experience, we, mm, in the beginning of our experience, um, we were more aggressive uh, and uh, we usually perform always a bilateral resection um, then now we are starting uh, uh, preserving the contralateral uh, ethmoid and we are comparing data for our first uh, uh, um, results on 80 patients uh, almost from Varese and Brescia says that there is not so uh, a statistic difference between oncological result with 
monolateral or bilateral resection. So now we are moving on with our study and perhaps at the end the conclusion will be no difference with monolateral and bilateral resection. Okay. We'd very much value any comments from the audience. If anybody has a query or wants to contribute to some of the comments made by the panel, please feel free. There are ladies with microphones around. Okay, so let's, let's start with a case. Oh, wait a minute, yes, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I took your name in okay. vain. Am uh, I right about what no, I said? Just to comment on that, and I will also uh, talk about it to, tomorrow. Indeed, in no more than 150 cases of uh, pure ITAC, we haven't one single case of a contralateral recurrence. Now, having said that, all of our patients get radiotherapy afterwards, so that may be a confounder. But it gives some confidence if you know that in more than 25 years of doing this kind of surgery, in more than 150 patients you have not seen a primary, I would say, contralateral recurrence. So that would say that you could use the nasal septal flap uh, taken contralaterally, but we haven't done it yet. Okay, thank you very much for that comment. We probably should have you up on the panel if we had a <laughs> Okay, so here's a 30-year-old male who's got unilateral nasal obstruction and serosanguinous discharge for three months. Serosanguinous discharge is never a good thing, I think we can say. It's, it, it, frank blood's one thing, but serosanguinous is not good, and mild epiphora. And um, I'll, I'll move us on because otherwise it's going to take a long time. We look in the nose and we can see that there's this rather vascular-looking... Um, uh, in, uh, polyp in the upper part of the nose, um, we've got a CT scan and we've got an MRI scan there. Um, obviously, I'm, I haven't shown you all the MRI and all the CT. Is there any other imaging you would do um, in, in this situation? No. no. We, would, okay. we would like to do a PET also, PET scan also. Okay, I haven't told you what the tumour is yet. So, so now I'll tell you that it's an olfactory neuroblastoma, okay, which you would probably have guessed from the appearances here. Um, so you'd, would you go for a pet for all olfactories? Okay, so you're in the minority there. Hands up who'd also do a pet? Uh, Two. Two out of it uh, gentlemen. Depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Oh, right. Okay. Any other imaging? That you, if you didn't do a PET, what, no, anything it, else? It, it's a matter of tumor kinetics. The TEP, you need a fast-growing tumor. So it's if it's high grade, so probably uh, high grade uh, three or grade four, yeah. then TEP would. Would, would make sense. But otherwise, it okay. would be negative uh, at, with, without value. Okay, David. I even then would not do um, a PET scan unless that there is, let's say, the ultrasound, so the lymph nodes in the neck are to me important. Okay, so you've actually sort of raised the, the point that I wanted to ask you about. Um, I think that it's the one tumour where I get quite anxious about neck disease. I never used to be that fussed about it, but we did a uh, review and we looked at our cases again, and there's no doubt that the olfactories do present sometimes with disease in the neck, and they can sometimes get disease in the neck later on in their condition. Um, and so we do ultrasound and FNA, if necessary, our patients at staging, and um, indeed will include the neck in the MRI scan, both at the initial um, diagnosis and in subsequent uh, follow-up. So I think it is, it is worth considering. It's not every case, obviously, but as you see, the, the range is quite wide, but it's possibly you know, one in four, one in five cases that may get a problem, and it's 17% in my group. Has that been your experience as well? Have you, yes. You, yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so there, there's our chap. Um, what would you like to do? Pepper, what would you like to do with him? We will do this endoscopically. The tumor is quite small. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to get uh, a good result with purely endoscopic resection. Okay, any, any other comments? But there, there are, I think there is an upcoming controversy because uh, if you look at the pendulum, First, when the endoscopy came out, 
the idea, and Steinberger had published a case like this, was to do a nasal surgery and to do gamma knife on the olfactory bulb. Then, with the uh, advent of more advanced procedures, it became the standard to remove the tumor and the scalp base and the olfactory bulb, at least on the same side. And then maybe even larger surgery, and I think we, coming back for low grade would be to remove the, the, the ethmoid on that side, the, the content of the nasal fossa, the septum from that side, the olfactory bulb, but then to analyze very cautiously on, on MRI, and then with frozen section, whether the other side is involved or not, because it could be a unilateral disease at one prob probably. Okay. Any, anything else? <coughs> Everybody on the panel is going to go for endoscopic surgery off the bat, yes? Okay. But for a high grade, for sure, we will start for HEMS type 3 and 4, we perform preoperatively chemotherapy. Okay, so let's, let's say that, sorry, David. But just a, a brief question. You mentioned that this patient had epiphora. So he did have a little bit of epiphora, but no. I, it was a red herring, okay. as we say in English. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a, it's a true case, so that's what he presented no, no, with, but he didn't have any reason for having it, other than the fact that he may have had a bit of inflammation in his inferior meatus. doesn't really show that on the scans. Um, Okay, so what's the panel's position then on this uh, business about the olfactory bulb? Because I think it is quite interesting. It's a bit like the field change. Um, we know there's potential for microscopic disease in the olfactory bulb and tract, um, and we've seen it in patients where it's pretty obvious. Should all patients have, do you, resect the olfactory bulb in a case like that, where there is no obvious skull base extension, would you resect the bulb on one side or both sides or no sides? Let's have a panel thing. Both sides, one side or no sides. Chem. The skull base is intact. The skull base is intact. Uh... Ostensibly, Mike, on macroscopic dissection, and the scan didn't show anything obvious in the bulbs. But still, through the cribriform plates, uh, uh, plate, it could really reach microscopically. So mm -hmm. my endoscope would not show that to me. Okay. So to be definitive on that side, I would uh, go and resect and uh, try to keep the other side intact for the quality of life issues of the patient. So unilateral? Unilateral. OK. Uh, I would now do again. unilateral. Unilateral, Paolo? Unilateral, send the dura for frozen section if uh, it will be involved uh, bilateral and uh, the patient uh, is informed about this. If okay. during surgery the dura is involved, we will perform a bilateral resection due to the crossing. Uh, Philippe? Fibers. Same. Unilateral, yeah? Unilateral. Unilateral. Same like Paolo. Okay. I mean, I. Uh, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer to this, actually. Um, I mean, what you're basically saying, you're going to preserve one side. Um, we'll come back to that. I mean, when I looked at our figures, um, when there were 30 olfactories that had had endoscopic surgery, which were relatively small T1, T2 lesions, I did take the olfactory bulbs on both sides to see, and not one of them had disease in their olfactory mm -hmm. bulbs. So uh, you saw a little bit at the beginning, I could take a little piece as a biopsy, if you like, but of course, if you do that, you sacrifice the sense of smell. Um, having said that, does it matter whether you save one side or not? Mm. Are you going to treat this patient with any additional things? So who would give the patient radiotherapy or chemotherapy after you've done your endoscopic resection, if you're happy with the endoscopic resection, mm -hmm. there's no disease in the olfactory bulbs mm -hmm. as far as you can tell, would you give radiotherapy? Oh. David, you wouldn't give it? I wouldn't. Okay. The margins are clear, no. You wouldn't give it? Okay. Philippe, would you give radiotherapy? Uh, I'm, I'm in trouble. The, the standard of care is usually to do for that disease uh, post-op uh, radiotherapy. Okay. But it's true that if we have an excellent resection, you could discuss about it, but 
I, I don't know if we can reach the truth today. Okay, Paolo? Nowadays we perform radiotherapy, but I don't know there are, if there will be in the future right. necessity. Oh, big you, radiotherapy. Okay, Jim? Well, actually, uh, due to this situation in Turkey, we are a big country, 80 millions. If I, I, I know that the patient will come to the follow-ups regularly. Uh, I may wait, mm -hmm. uh, not, um, but otherwise I would give. What would you wait for? Uh, for, for the, for, for the, uh, <laughs> the follow-ups, because sometimes the patients, you know, uh, although we ask them to come regularly to follow-ups, they, they disappear. David. I just would like to make a comment on that. Let's say there used to be a guideline based on on, dot, uh, on a review by Pavel Dulgro from mm -hmm. Lancet Oncology that everyone is citing. And they say no matter what kind of um, olfactory neuroblastoma, they all need radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, and this is something that we should collect all together, yep. many of us have patients that they, wouldn't, that they didn't go for radiotherapy immediately after surgery. And so also we have only a few patients, about um, eight to 10 patients that didn't undergo radiotherapy. And I think this is the crucial question that every one of us has only 10 or so, but so we follow them for quite a long time. See, the problem for me is that, I mean, you know, we're desperately trying to save the sense of smell, but if we give them radiotherapy, of course, that will then have an adverse effect on the sense of smell, whatever absolutely. our radiotherapy colleagues does. However, I have to say, if you are going to give radiotherapy, um, do you have any strong feelings about what sort of radiotherapy? What, Philly, what would they give at La Boisier? What sort of well, radiotherapy? It would be uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy. Now, uh, the, the, we, we, we have shown a, it's a retrospective studies, but the, the rate of, of uh, brain complications is much uh, lower. And uh, furthermore, it has been shown that the, the control of disease, local control, is even better with uh, modulated intensity uh, radiotherapy because you have a more uh, homogeneous delivery of the dose. You don't have some area under-radiated and other over-radiated. Same in Italy? I am Mati, yeah. Yeah. Um, do any of you use chemo at all? Any adjuvant chemotherapy? Any, any advocates for that? Cisplatin? Um, we analyzed uh, recently the data on this topic and we couldn't find that there is any evidence that some, that the chemo really has an effect. Okay. So um, I must admit that we give all our patients radiotherapy. Um, and the reason for this is not just the Dolgorov analysis, but when we looked at our craniofacial series, we had taken a decision years ago when we were absolutely always taking the olfactory bulbs and tracks. Mm -hmm. We would look at them, and if there was disease, then they got radiotherapy. And if there was no disease in the olfactory bulb and tracks, mm -hmm. they didn't get radiotherapy. Yeah. So they had the smaller tumors. And then I followed <coughs> them up for a long time. And what I was rather alarmed to see was the ones that had had radiotherapy had a 4% recurrence rate, even though they had the bigger tumors. And the ones who had the small tumors and had no radiotherapy had a 28% recurrence mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, this was pretty good evidence that the radiotherapy is necessary to reduce local recurrence. Um, because if you wait until they get that recurrence, mm -hmm it can be very difficult to deal with, and particularly if it occurs elsewhere on the skull base. So I must admit, our practice is to give radiotherapy. We use IMRT. Um, they happen to be building two bunkers, one in uh, Manchester and one in uh, our own hospital at UCL, to put a proton beam uh, machine in. Uh, and as you know, when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. So they're looking for cases to use proton beam on. But I have to say that the evidence for proton beam in olfactories is vanishingly small. Um, however, it may be useful. We will see. Um, so what did I do? Well, I did pretty much what you suggested. Um, I took the tumor out, did a wild, wide field resection, uh, superior septum, 
there was no obvious in intracranial extension. Um, I took the olfactory bulb on that side. It had no disease in it. Patient had a um, hospital stay of three days, had a small pack in which we take, in those days we were using a pack that had to be removed um, formally, it wasn't a dissolvable pack, and the patient started their radiotherapy. And happily that patient is alive and well um, at eight years follow up. And if you choose your patients carefully, then with an endoscopic resection, you can expect to get really good um, overall results, as you can see from, uh, from this Kaplan Meyer. Okay, so this isn't quite such a small olfactory. This is a rather larger one. Um, and um, it is an olfactory neuroblastoma. It is a grade three, it's moderately aggressive. Who'd like to do that endoscopically? Uh, Jenny Carroll. What, what we would do is we would go, uh, give an induction chemotherapy first mm -hmm. and then followed by uh, endoscopic craniofacial resection and uh, follow it up again with a chemo rat. That's okay. how we do it. Does that appeal to the other members of the panel? Uh, we have another strategy. It depends from uh, the response of chemotherapy. We will start with the chemotherapy. If we have at the end of six cycles uh, a response uh, uh, much more than 80%, we will uh, leave the patient for the radiotherapy without surgery. If the response will be less, so we will have uh, surgery, uh, uh, sorry, if the response will be um, less, uh, if it's possible, surgery and then radiotherapy. And what sort of chemotherapy do you use? Uh, um, cisplatin, cisplatin-based? Cisplatin, not yeah. the exact scheme, I don't know. Really okay, being. sorry. <laughs> you <laughs> sorry. don't know what they do to your the patients? Exact <laughs> something horrible, Cisplat they give them something horrible, yes, right. <laughs> but Philippe? If ever, I agree completely that if it's a high grade, a bad grade three, and that the, the result of chemo is excellent, probably there won't be surgery. But if ever there is surgery, of course, as an expert surgeon with a neurosurgeon, you say, this one, yeah, I can catch it endoscopically. But if you look in details at the orbit apex, you, mm. you might not be uh, sure that you catch every corner of involved dura above the apex. So I need, I think you should be ready for a transbasal, a subfrontal classic. Then eventually you start endoscopically, and then you get the margins and you see, but you really should drive the patient <laughs> from the very beginning, otherwise you get a trouble. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I suppose this is, I put this up really to ask you about your limits for curative resection when there is intracranial involvement. Um, clearly, it depends on the tumor, it depends on the patient, how old they are, what other factors in their general health. but. If we look at the specific factors relating to a tumour in that region, what's the sort of things which you say, actually, I'm not going to even attempt this endoscopically? I mean, in the, um, in the uh, supplement for um, our position paper, we had sort of absolute and relative contraindications, and that some of those have changed with time. But what are, the, what are the things you say, that's it, there's no way I'm going to do an endoscopic resection here? Uh, I would say cavernous sinus involvement, mm -hmm. if the, the tumor is involving the cavernous sinus, and the internal carotid artery. Um, and of course, sometimes the superior, uh, the orbital apex, if that is going to be involved, then I think it's going to be difficult endoscopically to resect it. So these are the three important factors which will decide whether I will go in and give a curative treatment endoscopically or not. Okay. What about the relationship between the tumor and the dura and the brain, for example? If, if there's lots of significant uh, intraparenchymal brain involvement. Sorry, Papa, I can't hear you. If there's a lot of uh, intra brain involvement, like the ACA vessels are being involved and cased as well, so we won't be able to endoscopically. Also, it's involving the soft tissue, the, the frontal sinus itself, the back portion of the frontal sinus, or the skin involvement as well, so that mm. will not be endoscopically. Or if, uh, if there is uh, no CSF cuff around the lesion or the perilesional edema would also show some signs that it will not be curative. 
if, even if you reserve. Philip wants to say. Uh, uh, apart from the, the discussion about the orbit content, which you cannot We'll come clear. on to, yes. Okay. But concerning only Dura and Brain, I think there are two, uh, two things to consider. Is first, do you have a reasonable angle to reach this area? Okay. Yeah. But then there's also a more neurosurgical concept, which is how are the vessels above? Is the, the um, tumor pushing the arachnoid, or is it invading the pia mater? Then is there some brain edema, or vessels trapped in, in, inside the tumor? Then that might make things very difficult. Mm. And, and would it make it difficult to the extent that you would then opt for a conventional external open craniofacial approach, or alternatively go for... No, but the problem, if, if you have a, a true T4B, is that with the best surgery, sometimes uh, a few months later, you discover two uh, brainstem metastases through CSF, so yeah. it's, it's a nightmare. So, effectively, what we're saying is once the tumor has invaded yeah. the brain and no vessels, more limit. it's no incurable. More limit. Yeah. Um, and then you're very much reliant on your radiology, aren't you, to make that decision. And you know, one can't always be 100% sure, but you can get a pretty good idea. I must say, I get quite nervous when the tumor gets into the sagittal sinus as well, because particularly with olfactories, you know, these was, we'll see are tumors that can disseminate all the way around the um, dura. And um, that, that can be quite, I find that quite difficult to handle from below. And as Philippe made the point, lateral extent you've got to be able to get at it so if it's going over the uh, orbit then it's very difficult to get i find very difficult to get at so yes david you and uh, that's absolutely true and i think it also it also you have to imagine the situation that because the neurosurgeon they're coming from below they are sometimes keeping let's say they are in troubles to work around the optic nerve from superiorly whereas we from inferiorly we are able to manage all the different Hmm. tumor around the optic nerves medially and inferiorly and to me it's also very important that you need to have um, let's say not in this case but the ACOM for instance and the ophthalmic artery these are limits that you cannot manage from mm -hmm. below, I, I guess. But I think, you know, when we say we can go for an open approach, we can still combine it. I mean, that is yeah, the beauty. Absolutely. One can combine the endoscopic with the uh, external approaches. Okay, now, from time to time, you see these uh, things, these, peri these apical, uh, apical cysts, these cysts that are peritumoral tumoral, uh, in olfactory neuroblastomas. And I just wonder what the panel thinks about how important it is that they are removed. Uh, just a comment. You said there would not be any sneaky case. There are no sneaky okay, cases. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're all big boys. <laughs> You've seen these cases. <laughs> For a case like this, the significant brain parenchymal invasion as well. So we assist that may be or may not be, I'm not sure, but when there's significant brain parenchymal involvement like this, we may as well as do an open craniotomy and remove the whole thing. Because the amount of brain, inva uh, brain invasion by the tumor is significant. Any, also, yes, David. And also, I think then you have the option of, let's say, a pericranial flap for the reconstruction, because this may, may end up in a severe disaster. Yes, I mean, I think uh, the jury's out slightly out, but it is thought that you can get um, a little sort of rim of olfactory neuroblastoma in the edges of these um, cysts. I must say um, that uh, this lady is a patient that my husband and I did a craniofacial resection on some years ago. And we got to the point, we'd taken this thing out, it was infecting the frontal lobe, and there was this big cyst. And we thought, you know, we're not going to cure this lady, so we're going to stop. We'll leave the cyst. We've taken the vast majority of this tumor away. And it's the patient I went to afterwards, and I said, I'm really sorry. I, I no. genuinely don't think that we've been able to take this tumor out. And I think that, you know, your time may be limited, and you should, you know, use it and do what you want to do. So she said, fine. I'm going to give up my job and, you know, we'll put things in order. I saw her 14 years later. <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is a very unusual presentation. We never see neuroblastoma with cysts. There is no, oh, no they, tumor you do, cyst. You usually. do see them with olfactories mm. from time to time, but they're not that 
common, but you do see them, and they are a dilemma. But I have to say, what it taught me was never <laughs> tell a patient it's, it's <laughs> that things are going to go very, very badly, or yeah, because you may be wrong. Okay, now what about the length and method of follow-up for patients? I mean, we endlessly discuss this, um, but I think there's probably a consensus. David, how long do you follow your patients up for? Uh, in oh, Switzerland, actually, you can follow them up forever, every week. <laughs> oh, every day? No. No, um, <laughs> no, we follow them lifelong. Yeah. Definitely, because yeah, there are no data up to present when the re recurrence, or uh, let's say, you, you can see, you can never be sure, no matter what the grading system tells you. Yeah. Everybody happy with a lifelong follow up? You're sort of kind of married oh. to the patient, aren't you, Paolo? We stop after 10 years, except for anesthesia neuro. After 10 years? Except for anesthesia. Except for anesthesia, okay. Except, except for anesthesia. So after you wouldn't follow up a chondrosarcoma for? Uh, chondrosarcoma rare in children. Uh, we don't have, uh, perhaps, uh, could be in the children, uh, uh, also to see if there is a, a, um, a post, uh, a radioinductive uh, Okay. Tumor. And that's the case. Yeah, perhaps sarcoma. Yeah. Okay. But for squamous cell carcinoma, then carcinoma, ten years, I think is enough. Okay. Any any other comments? So everybody else is going for lifelong. I mean, that's certainly what we recommended in the document. And um, I must say that you know we do still get some nasty surprises, as you say, with olfactories. We've certainly had recurrences that. 17 years in patients that we followed carefully so we know it wasn't there you know at 16 years um, and um, we don't really know whether we have to stop but the problem is that they can get these recurrences in sort of surpri surprising places I mean all factories can pop up in the opposite eye the neck and these are the things these are the real killers these dural deposits. And what happens is sometimes the picture that the radiologist gives you cuts off the top yeah. here. And you say, well, actually, you haven't done the neck and you haven't done this bit. And that is where that recurrent disease is. Mm -hmm. Philippe, you yeah. wanted to say something. Philip, you, you... No, no, no. no. I, I, I agree mean, they, completely. We, we and have these are some cases to after treat. years you have on the site. So you really need to, to check all the brain, even far mm. from the lesion. Yeah, yeah, really also. important. And, um, you know, and these patients often have a completely clear cavity. They have no local recurrence. They've just got these deposits. So it's really curious, isn't it, the, the pathology, how that happens. So this, have the seeds of the tumour been there all along, all those years, and then suddenly spring into action? What, what's actually going on? On. I, I really don't know. Okay, let's move on to another case then. Any, any questions about the olfactories from the audience? Can you evaluate the radiotherapy? Can you tally the, the, the radiotherapy? Our radiotherapies tend to give a set course um, irrespective of the grading. Um, they do actually use adjuvant cisplatin uh, before the start of the radiotherapy and during, um, but um, as long as the patient is capable of having it. Um, they don't uh, tight, you know, decide depending on the type of the um, aggressiveness of the uh, tumour. I don't know. Philippe, do they, do they alter depending on the... Um, grade of olfactory or radiotherapist? Normally, no, no, we would never, like for the neck, discuss between uh, 45 and 55 and 65, no. Yeah. They okay. do the radiotherapy curative. Yeah. Yeah. Be difficult, I think, to do that at the moment. Okay, here's, here's an easy one. Here's a 74-year-old male woodworker. <laughs> the clues in the <laughs> first sentence. Uh, right nasal obstruction for six months, unilateral fleshy polyp on endoscopic examination. We all know where this is heading. Um, they have, he has an urgent CT scan done in the clinic just to see what's going on. Um, and um, here we see that there are uh, conveniently arrowed <laughs> some areas where the bone looks less than perfect. Um, so I did a biopsy and it was indeed a well differentiated intestinal type adenocarcinoma. What would you do next? Any, any volunteers? MRI scan. MRI, MRI scan. MRI. Everybody's going for an MRI. That's okay. That's Further imaging. Would you bother to um, actually do any other imaging of the body? This is an adenocarcinoma. 
Any, anybody? No, we usually we have a tap uh, thoracic abdominal uh, sc scanner. Sorry, Philippe, you have a? We always have a body CT. Body CT, that's all. Okay, I'm, I'm only asking because I mean, where he's got a, he's a woodworker, he's got an intestinal type. Uh, we think it's obviously related to his occupation. But can we be sure? Should we, should we always be looking to make sure that they haven't got, you know, pancreas or something from the kidney or but the neck? The neck. The I mean, I don't, I don't do a screening in a patient like this, but I just wondered whether no, you did. Then you go for a kind of major surgery, so I think you have to evaluate him completely on an oncological basis, but mm. also the, the heart, etc., the coronary, mm. uh, the other score. But you're, you're not worried that it could be a primary from somewhere else in a situation like this? Normally not. It's not a trick question, no. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> But okay. We, we would have a CT. Let's see, say that if ever something happened in the post-op and you didn't do the CT, it's a problem, you know. Oh, okay. Better right. Mm. Um, so he has an MRI. He's got a, a largish uh, lesion. Its um, relationship to the orbit is um, possibly open for uh, discussion. What what factors would determine your approach in a patient like this, David? I would say when you do the, that's what we also do, um, when you do the biopsy under general anesthesia, we prefer to do it. But while we are sending this for frozen sections so that the pathologist can tell us that he has reliable material, we use this time to explore whether this is really infiltrating the orbit, yes or no. Because this is a crucial thing. You some, sometimes you cannot be 100% sure whether the orbit is infiltrated, yes or no, the, especially the peri-orbit. And this is for the approach very important. And same is true also for the anterior skull base. Here you got the impression that the dura potentially can be infiltrated. But you can use this time while waiting for the, for the frozen section to explore the dura on this portion. And then this is for the decision making important. I'm, I'm quite intrigued by the idea of exploring it. I mean, in, in what way are you exploring? So trying to see if there's a plane there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anybody else do that? Yeah. Usually when there is a, a bony erosion at the cribriform plate, we would not just cut the fillet and rely on the, the frozen section because the margin is so minimal and difficult to appreciate that we would go for the resection of the, the, base, the skull base. Yeah, in the end. Oh. Okay, so, um, I mean, one of the things that I've always been interested in is how tumours can arise from quite small sites, but be quite large tumours, and that things like adeno sometimes have an almost sort of pseudo-capsule, and that's the point you were making. There can be a cleavage plane, even in a situation where it looks as though the tumour has actually uh, infiltrated. Um, and clearly other factors will determine it. You know, what's the patient's general health? Can they, you know, withstand major surgery, et cetera, et cetera, and what is the tumor grade and type? Um, so with that particular case, um, we haven't explored it to see what the plane is like. So let's ask Chem, say, whether you would be happy to do that endoscopically. I mean, I would take the consent for an open approach too, mm -hmm. but I would definitely start with an endoscopic approach. And as the case uh, goes by, then, then you, you can at any time uh, convert to an open approach. And would you be happy to do that, or would you need to get your neurosurgeon along? Uh, I would do. I mean, we have, we have the same OR, I mean, we are in the same central So they're OR. next door. Yes, yeah, you they're give next them a door, shout. so I can reach any time, but uh, we have been doing ourselves principally so yeah. if if it's not really invading the brain yeah. so it's only in the our side so it's only if it's only the dura invasion we would do ourselves yeah, no, if it goes be beyond we would ask what would happen in Varese Paolo? in Varese we will do um, for sure endoscopically and uh, of course in this case uh, the image seems not to, to be too much doubtful I think we would not change the, the approach I think this can be performed endoscopically, of course. Uh, if uh, the margins of the dura goes over the orbit or anterior and on the frontal table of the front, uh, the patient is informed that we can change always, but I think in this case we will do it endoscopically. 
So would anybody apart from Chem consent the patient for a formal yeah. craniofacial that yeah. they would go on to do under the same anaesthetic? Or yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The neurosurgeon are always informed about these cases. Fine. Uh, so I did what you suggested. I that was rising from the superior middle turbinate. I did a wide fold resection, and we were going to talk about field change, but we sort of covered that already. There was a clear plane of cleavage with the orbital periosteum, uh, no no real intracranial extension. The uh, bone was thin, but it was easy to skeletonize, and uh, the patient uh, was in hospital for a short time and had uh, radiotherapy postoperatively. Just out of interest, does everybody treat their adenocarcinomas with radiotherapy afterwards? Yes, I know Mark would. does. <laughs> <coughs> yes, we would, but the, the, I have a question about your four weeks. You have several cases where you say that the, you do the, the radiotherapy four weeks after the surgery, mm. and uh, we, we are reluctant to, to start so early because we, when we do professionata, three layers, we, we but wait he didn't really. really have that. I mean, he had a skeletonized skull base with a bit of yeah, inferior turbinate on it. Before you had yeah. the same delay. Yeah, I think you're right. You'd wait if there was a, a larger um, reconstruction. Um, okay, so everything went tickety boo, and there were no complications, and he did very well. Uh, and I followed him up each uh, few weeks, each then few months, then uh, every uh, nine months, and then I spotted this little area at the top of the cavity, which was looking a bit edematous, and also had this uh, area that was slightly bleeding here. So I'm clearly very suspicious it's a uh, recurrence. What would you do? A biopsy. Sorry? A biopsy. You biopsy. Would you sort of go for an excisional biopsy, or would you just? A minimal biopsy. A minimal biopsy. Be because sometimes you, you may have in the irradiated cavities yeah. some granulation tissues. Yeah. So it's not always tumor, but you need to know. But the problem is if you clean it up in the outpatient clinic and it's positive and then it has healed and you don't know where it was. Okay, so you a do problem. a formal biopsy under general anesthetic. No, 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 no you do it under local. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so a small biopsy under local in the outpatients. No? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. Any, any? No, yeah. David? A small biopsy uh, in the OPD. In the, in the outpatients. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I would resect it under general anesthesia because if you follow it, you always have this question and you are raising the question whether you have been on the right place to take the biopsy. Okay, Paolo? No, I would have um, a biopsy in the in ambulatory, a patient biopsy. A biopsy in the outpatients? Outpatient. Yes, okay. We, we do very little in the outpatients in the UK, but I'm just interested. Uh, and Chem? I, mean, uh, I have better set up in the OR, so we have four ORs there, they yeah. available. So I will take to the OR, even if it's in local, I would do in the OR. And Prepper, you were going for outpatients, were Outpatient, you? Outpatient, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and it looked fine. So <coughs> I took it out and there was no problem and he's still going strong. Now, we, we touched on this issue of so, the... Sorry. Sorry. So you did surgery? He I did, yes. I did an endoscopic resection and that was it. I didn't give him any radiotherapy afterwards. He'd already had radiotherapy. He already had it. And yes. so any issue with healing in those cases? With... Skin healing. Oh, healing. No. Well, this was this was eight and a half years after his original radiotherapy, so it didn't really pose any problems. Um, we touched on this issue of the orbit and how, you know, it can be difficult sometimes. You can have a situation where clearly there is a, a nice sort of cleavage plane, and you can have situations where there's a little bit of erosion, but it's probably not significant. It might just be onto or through the periosteum. Uh, but unfortunately, life isn't always like that. Um, so here's a lady who has a very unpleasant, even though it's low-grade, adenocarcinoma that's come back after mm -hmm. several procedures done at the obvious St. Elsewhere's. Um, what are we going to do for that? It is a low-grade mm -hmm. adenocarcinoma in a 74-year-old. Mm -hmm. I can put the picture back. What would you what would you suggest to her? Is the vision intact? Sorry, Prepper? Is the vision intact? Vision. Does she have vision in the eye? Yes, yeah. 
the vision is intact. It's not a very academic case again, but if it's really a... Well, it's a real case. Yeah, but the <laughs> problem is we, we don't know that much. When was the last procedure? If it was uh, 20 and then 10 okay, years the last, before... Okay, I'm so sorry. The last procedure was about three or four years ago. Okay, and you have an idea of the extent of the procedure? Did, no. Did the surgeon leave a lot of, of tumor or we is it know. fast growing? We don't know. Because we could expect, if it's really a low grade, that it's growing very, very slowly. And so you really have to analyze whether you could peel it off the orbit if the function is normal, if the motility is normal. Uh, the motility is not normal. <laughs> it's not normal. No. No, okay, the, so. She has got a little bit of vision in that eye, but it's not, you know, okay. it's not normal. It's not a normal eye. David. Uh, I'd like to, uh, let's say, to focus on one uh, thing. On the nasal bone, or let's say the frontal process of the maxillar, uh, maxillary bone here, there? is eroded as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, to me, an important factor that has to be taken into account. Which would make you... More aggressive, less aggressive? Yeah. Well, if you argue just for, let's say, you do some kind of gross total resection and you, pre you avoid, you are a little bit too uh, reluctant to go for an orbital accentuation and arguing you can do a post-operative radiotherapy, this can be a crucial point for radiotherapy. Hmm. In the sense of that it will not have any effect on this in this area and then no. the recurrence will Right, come right over there. And indeed, it's low-grade adenocarcinoma, so the radiotherapy not might very not be very effective yeah. anyway. I mean, it's a terrible case. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it raises the question, you know, what are your limits when mm. it comes to the orbit and the orbital periosteum? She's an extreme example, clearly. Um, and in the end, um, she decided she wanted no treatment. Mm -hmm. She said it's... You know, it is as it is. I don't want to lose my eye. I don't want to go. And, and she had no treatment. She had palliative care. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about perhaps the issue of tumor, periosteum, and intraorbital spread. Because I know that um, in Verese, for example, you have been quite aggressive in endoscopically resecting tumor that's gone beyond the periosteum. Um, uh if the tumor involves the, uh, the periosteum, we can reset the periorbit, uh, the periosteum, so mm. we treat it endoscopically. If the tumor involves the anterior part of the orbit, we exenterate the orbit. If the tumor involves the apex, we don't treat the patient. The patient is died. And we will, there is a, my colleague, Mario Turrizzaroni, that did a study. We don't have any patient alive more than two years if the orbital apex is involved. So, periorbit we can reserve. Anterior part of the orbit, we have to accentuate the orbit. Orbital apex, we don't treat it. Mm. Yeah, but and the problem is also the histology, because of if it's SCC, yeah. of course, but if it's a low grade, then uh, the, we, we had an issue with a, a lady like this for olfactory. So, the, the, we, she needed the orbital clearance and, and she, she refused. And then the tumor grew slowly for years and years. And then there was her awful, ugly face in the newspaper. And she was telling the journalist that nobody would take care of her, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was tough. Sad. Very sad. But there's one more factor which we always uh, have to consider, apart from, you know, the patient also says that please don't do anything to the eye. When, when the patient does not consent for, give consent for the orbital eccentration, then we are left with no option, like we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. so that's exactly what happened to your patient as well. So, yeah. What we do is, if, we, if periorbital of fat is involved, we will look endoscopically. The problem comes, the muscle is involved, mm -hmm. but the vision is normal. Then it becomes a very difficult dilemma. If the muscle is involved, there is uh, the eye movement reduction, is, the movements are reduced, there's no vision, it's no brainer. But to take away a normal vision eye, that becomes a very emotional issue. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not saying this is an easy decision. I mean, it isn't, and it has to be made with the patient. But I must say, I, I think I'm with Paola there. You know, if, you, if it's gone through the periosteum and it's involving the orbital contents, and that for me would be, you know, quite a bit of fat 
and muscle, then the eye goes. If the patient is curable, right. let's mm. say that, obviously, from an outset. The type of malignancy, Philip uh, mentioned this, squamous cell carcinoma, bad news uh, generally, because of its ability to embolize through the uh, eye and go out into the apex. And I see a, f a few patients who have malignancy in the lacrimal sac, and then and they almost always had a, a DCR incision at some point, but I, I always combine it with a small external incision to get at the sac uh, if there's a malignancy in it. Okay, and we know that having involvement of the orbit, as, as uh, Paolo said, is very bad news. If the uh, eye is extensively involved, uh, even if you remove it, the outcome is poor. Um, now, this is a case that some of us will be familiar with. A gentleman had a unilateral polyp removed. Um, uh, the surgeon did a routine endoscopic sinus operation. And, oh, dear, it's an adenocarcinoma. I'll send it to somebody else. Um, so what would you suggest doing? You're going to treat them, give them some radiotherapy, give them surgery. I haven't told you what it is, of course. So it is actually, say, an adenocarcinoma. It doesn't almost matter, does it? I mean, you see this case quite often. How I've... old is he? It, okay, let's say he's 56. <laughs> Did I say I can't remember? I may have put the page. 48. He's 48. 40. <laughs> I was close. Okay. He's 48. I mean, it is difficult, isn't it? Um, they think they've removed it all. What would you do? They say they've got, we've taken it out and we've got uh, the adenocarcinoma and the polyp and I've done some other endoscopic surgery. I didn't send all the other tissue off, you know. But they think it's out. What would you do? Philly, what would you do? I think we would go for, for margin, so we would uh, see the, the pre-op imaging and we would be lucky if we can find it. Yep. And, and then Will have possibly, mysteriously disappeared, probably. Yeah, and then we would remove all the, the scar area. And it's very common that we found foci of tumors and most of the cases in the, in the cribriform area. Uh, in the middle of the scar tissue because otherwise if you go for a radiation with air one or air two there is tumor inside but you don't know it, it's it's really difficult mm. what we would do is chances are this tumor left behind because they did a polypectomy yeah. they didn't do an oncological surgery no. so we will resect everything and just leave the skull base the orbit the anterolacrimal wall of the maxilla and take out everything else. So you'd go for a sort of wide field yes. resection. David, do you want I would do the same, but uh, what I would stress, I would make a sort of mapping, yeah. taking a several biopsies so that yeah. I have an idea, idea where the tumor can potentially be left. Yeah. Uh, I have a small comment here. Uh, sometimes when we take a post-operative MRI after a, a certain period of time, sometimes we're not able to differentiate tumor from actually the fibrous tissue. So sometimes that also gives a confusion. So we generally go in for a complete excision till the level of the orbital uh, uh, periosteum and uh, till the skull base. Philip. And the problem is that at the time of surgery, when you don't have an idea of the original site involved, you are forced to do a much larger surgery because the, the scarring tissue, even the bone, becomes changed and you don't know if it's due to disease or to surgery. So in the end, it ends up with a much wider surgery than probably what would have been needed. Yeah, so d does it matter? Does it matter that this happened and you're now having to pick up the pieces? Paolo, you've looked at this sort of thing in... Yeah, I will do the same like Professor Herman. The same. I would be, we would be back, and uh, mm, mm -hmm. of course, uh, mm -hmm. according to frozen section, we will extend our endoscopic resection. Yeah, but I mean, I, th I think there's a there's a broader issue here, isn't there? I mean, it's one thing. Obviously, sometimes people take a biopsy and it, they, it's a surprise. They find it and they send it on. But we do have patients where somebody's had a go. I mean, you know, this is a unilateral polyp. So, you know, what was going on here? And uh, I'll speak to Mark in the, in the audience, but I mean, there's also the uh, series from Piero, and I think it included uh, cases from Varese, which show very clearly that if you have a go, you do that patient a serious um, uh, harm because the outcome for them will be much worse. 
Here's the um, group from uh, Mark Yorison, where you can see first surgery done at the tertiary referral center. Not everybody's cured, obviously, but if it's had something done elsewhere, you really put the patient at risk. And the same was it found in the Italian series, three-year survival in the adenocarcer, 76% versus 52%. Mark, I don't know if you're still there and you want to comment, but I mean, it is a, a, a real problem um, for uh, patients if somebody sort of had a potential go. I think he's gone away now. <laughs> Oh, no, there he is. Come on, Mark, you have to step up. Get back, get <laughs> he's, back. he's behind you, as they say in the pantomime. <laughs> We're waiting for your microphone to come on. Another one? Yeah. <laughs> A backup. So in our series, we came to the conclusion that the five-year disease-specific survival, if we're treating residual disease, well, there's a case like this, is about something like 75%, and if you're treating it primarily in the correct way, it's about 85%, meaning that you have a 10% decrease in disease-specific survival in five years. In other words, you have about two-thirds more deaths because of disease if you're treating residual disease, and that's for us an argument uh, to really convince our peripheral ENT surgeons not to go for surgery if they see something unilateral with maybe suspect, but just take a biopsy and send it. Excuse me, residual or recurrent? Residual? Residual. Okay. So in a case like this, when uh, you see a large biopsy, you take it out. In our calculation, that will cost the patient 10% of survival in five years which for me is unacceptable. So quite serious. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so now we're moving on. Uh, this is an elderly lady, uh, never done anything uh, in her life to have a, a problem like this, but she gets a bad nosebleed that goes on for uh, some months and then blockage in the nose, and then she gets a little bit of displacement of her right eye. Um, she's otherwise fit and well. She lives on her own, there's no family. And you look in the nose and you see uh, this, which uh, is sort of rather fleshy and rather black. So I think we know what it is. Um, and unfortunately, oh she's got a uh, malignant uh, mucosal melanoma, which is moderately sizable and having an effect on her eye. What are you going to do with that one? <laughs> Any offers? Endoscopic. Endoscopic? And protonic ther a proton therapy. P palace, is that you, sorry? Endoscopic. Yes. Maximum debulking without yes. opening the dura, without removing the eye, without, without going inside the eye. And then nowadays we send it for proton therapy for the new protocols on the residual part. This is nowadays what we do before M MRT. Yes, I didn't quite catch what sort of radi radiotherapy. Proton. Proton, proton beam. Proton beam. Do you? How interesting. Okay. Anybody else? Tumors of this size will most probably have met somewhere. So I think we'll have to look for uh, the possibility of metastasis somewhere else. And if she had met, would you not treat her? Well, I'll send it to the tumor board and it'll be up to them. If they ask me to do the surgery, I'll do the surgery like what he did. But uh, there's, we have quite a few cases like this. Invariably, within six months, there's a met either in the liver or in the bowel or something like that. Even though she's got bleeding uh, from the nose, blocked nose right. and... Uh, but then, then the surgery is not an oncological surgery, it's two no. different things altogether. Uh, well, uh, I didn't say it would have to be oncological, I just said what would you do? Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you may even try some kind of immunomodulation or some treatment before because the same when we are dealing with a classic tumour, we're saying if it's big, we do chemo first. For melanoma, the chemo has no uh, advantage. But uh, in turn, you can uh, propose uh, alternative treatments like immunotherapy. Usually, the targeted therapy are not so efficient. They are not BRAF mutated. But still, there might be some results. So. OK. David. Uh, I would, for local control, I would do it because in our series we could demonstrate that we had local control 
almost perfectly. So they all died from distant metastasis. In the meantime, we have new concepts by the, uh, by the dermatologists that have MEK inhibitors, new MEK inhibitors that are quite promising, let's say, to get it under control. But I think the prime, let's say, the principal issue should be here to make the patient symptom free. And yeah. th that's the reason why I would go for any therapy. So I, I would agree with you there. Um, I resected it as much as I was able, um, and um, I did take a bit of the orbital periosteum. Uh, I repaired it with a split skin graft, um, and we talked about radiotherapy, um, but we decided against it. And the reason for this is exactly my experience as yours has been, David. We, um, years ago, were doing you know, craniofacials and maxillectomies on these patients, and they were still dying within often a very short time, and you did horrible things to them, and they had a miserable end. So it was the first malignant tumor that I started removing endoscopically. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I have been doing since the uh, 1990s is basically taking as much as I possibly can. It might be all of it macroscopically or not all of it, mm -hmm. and uh, seeing what happened. And when we analyzed the results and compared this with the ones that I'd done previously with the bigger operations, they were actually doing better, certainly up to um, five years, 59-month uh, median overall survival for the endoscopic group against 18 months for the open group. Now, there are, there are lots of reasons why that might be, because there's a historical difference. And the overall survival is no better. It's still sort of 27, 28 percent. But you don't knock these patients about. You're doing a very quick procedure. The patient's in and out of hospital. And they certainly, in the initial years, do better. Um, we did not find radiotherapy made much difference, I'll be honest with you, although the numbers are such that it's always difficult to prove it statistically. I haven't used proton beam. As I say, we don't have it available unless the patients are sent to France or to uh, the States. Um, so you raised the, the issue, Philippe, and I think this is a really interesting one. Just like you mentioned, she survived for quite a while. She had no local recurrence, but she died of metastases. And that, as you said, is a very common scenario with these patients. I just would like to make a comment because, uh, let's say, in the beginning of the biological diagnose, uh, um, issues, let's say the uh, biological therapies, it was just the idea that those that have any CK mutation or BRAF mutation, they are... Um, they can be sent for a biologic, but in the meantime, there are new um, uh, biologicals on the market, or let's say minimum in the phase three study that can do. Yeah, so, so it's a big growth area. I mean, it's obviously, as you say, driven by the dermatologists uh, with the, the bad skin melanomas, uh, and you obviously have to have um, the, the right tumor uh, but I have a number of patients who uh, are either on um, pembrolizumab or uh, ipilimumab, um, and you know we'll we'll wait to see because goodness knows it's a horrible horrible tumour. Okay, so here's a 27-year-old lady. She's had a blocked nose on both sides for ages. Um, and she only really bothered about it when she started to lose vision in the right eye. And to cut to the chase, her nose was largely blocked with an enormous swollen thing. Uh, you wasn't, there wasn't even any point taking an endoscopic picture because that's the scan, <laughs> which, as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, so there she is with what is pretty obviously, well, it could just as an outside be an osteosarcoma, but the fact that it's midline like that, looks like that, your, your bet is on a chondrosarcoma, isn't it? So we've got a big chondrosarcoma, um, and um, it doesn't, look, doesn't get better when you do the MRI scan. <laughs> so um, what would you like to do with that one? <laughs> can you show again the, the picture, please? The CT? Yeah. So because the, for uh, chondrosarcoma of the skull base, which are most often the petroclival, the standard of care is uh, surgery, and very often the removal is not complete, and so depending on the grade would be proton beam. 
But here, the problem is that I think that the tumor can be resected, that's the first step, but it should be resected very completely because obviously <laughs> we will face here limitations of radiotherapy. We have critical structures and they will be peeled off the tumor, but obviously you cannot deliver the dose for a chondrosarcoma, which is 72 grays. Otherwise you kill the vision of the lady. So it will be a, a, a tough surgery with the aim of removing everything and then <laughs> looking after should be. So it's, and it's a well-differentiated chondrosarcoma, yeah. I should say. It's not a mesenchymal or anything odd mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, um, in fact, my husband, David Howard, and I set about it with a mid-facial degloving, actually, and an endoscope, and removed it. And it looked really very nice, and we uh, saw her regularly, and these scans are taken at uh, two years. She'd been having regular post-operative scans. Um, we don't give them radiotherapy because radiotherapy, conventional radiotherapy for well-differentiated chondrosarcoma doesn't seem to be uh, massively helpful. And there is no proton beam and certainly wasn't at this point. And, and we know that the problem with chondrosarcoma, just as uh, you were saying, Philippe, is that you, know, you can get good results, but there is this attrition that occurs over time. And it's largely because little bits can get left behind, or indeed, you can have multifocal disease in the skull base. And it, it can be very, very difficult to deal with. So here she is at four years. And on the uh, follow-up MRI, I spot this. Mm -hmm. And you have to be careful on the MRIs because it doesn't show the calcification. You, it looks like little cysts, which of course is the calcium. Um, and um, my radiologist spotted it, I spotted it. You couldn't see anything in the cavity. Um, what would you do for that? Paolo, what would you do? Yeah, uh, at some cases, almost like this one, um, the, it's not like squamous cell carcinoma. You cannot feel the margin. Sometimes there is a capsule where I will do, I will get back uh, with the endoscopic approach there for sure. Perhaps you can have clear margins. Yeah, so it can be encapsulated, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. everybody. Agreed happy to try and remove that endoscopically, okay? So that's what I did, and everything went very well. So um, scans were looking good. This is seven years after the initial operation, three years after the recurrence, which I'd removed endoscopically. And then she came back with that. So now she's got quite a sizable lump of chondrosarcoma at the orbital apex. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> Real case. Pal, bulk, what do you do? The bulk as much as I could and the proton beam. Mm. Okay. Any, any other suggestions? No. I, I did the reverse thing. I had the same case and we did the proton earlier. So he lost the vision due to treatment. <laughs> But then he was controlled, but I don't know for so how many years. Yeah, so maybe proton beam, but this is the tumor, isn't it, that you know, has and called OMA, ha, that have really, has really been shown for it to have some benefit. Um, what did we do? Well, we did another sort of combined endoscopic craniofacial approach uh, with the neurosurgeons. We actually took her eye out. Um, whether or not that was the right thing to do, I don't know. Um, and explored the orbital apex. Um, we think it was removed, but likely there's some residual disease there, and she's now being considered for proton beam therapy. So it's unlikely that we've cured this lady, but we are now something like uh, 12, 13 years since her original surgery. Okay, and another. 54-year-old GP, general practitioner, complaining of bilateral nasal obstruction for six months, and his GP gave uh, him intranasal steroids for three months. And uh, then when he still didn't get better, he asked for a referral. So he went to the ENT doctors and they looked at his nose and they said, you've got polyps. You've got polyps on both sides um, and you probably need some surgery. So I'll arrange for a CT scan. So he had a non-urgent CT scan done, which I'm afraid not in Switzerland, but in the UK took a few weeks to get. <laughs> And he had this scan done. Mm. 
And unfortunately, the report by the radiologist said there was bilateral nasal polyposis. And they didn't mention that there was just a tiny bit of bone erosion. <laughs> And then, you know, they talk about the Swiss cheese where all the holes come together. Well, this is a Swiss cheese because the patient was seen in the outpatients. And for some reason that day, the PAC system wasn't working. So they couldn't get the scan up, but they could get the report. And they saw the report and they said, oh, it's okay. You've got polyps. So you can come in and have an operation. So I'll put you on the waiting list to have an operation. So he went on the waiting list to have an operation. And when he came in, um, in fact, he actually preempted it because things were not going well. Um, his eye was now bulging, and his wife said, you've got to do something about this. So he went along, and they did an MRI, and sadly, he had a sign of his nasal undifferentiated carcinoma. So, what are you going to do for this general practitioner? Any offers, David, you? Uh, well, it's a, a very difficult task because in this situation you have brain edema and then I would say endoscopically is not really the, the definite solution. Chemo, chemo chemo so if you weren't going to do anything endoscopically apart from the biopsy, say, to prove mm. what it was, what, would you um, give any treatment at all? What treatment would you use? Well, the... The prom, uh, let's say that the, the discussion that has to be made on the, on a tumor board is whether he has a, pre, um, a benefit from the um, neo adjuvant chemo radiation. Fine. W would that be pretty much the feeling of the? Yeah. Yeah. Supposing it was a much less extensive snook, what, what would your approach be to one that hasn't obviously gone wildly into the intracranial fossa? Would, would you have a preference for endoscopic surgery versus chemoradiation or all of these things or one first and then the other? What's, what's your normal plan? First induction, induction chemotherapy then if it's not that... Uh, Chem, say, say again loud. If it's not that uh, big, uh, then we can give uh, uh, induction chemotherapy and look if it is getting smaller. And if it's getting smaller then so you'd give uh, go, chemo go, go rads for, first. Go, go, go for uh, definitive chemo radiotherapy. Okay. Any 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 um, enthusiasm for chemo rads first? Everybody uh, happy with that or not? You see, you seem I think, unsure. <laughs> I think we would go in for a chemo rad. Yes. Everybody happy with that? Yep. So yep. when you do give these patients chemo radiotherapy, very often the snooks will just melt away. I mean, really melt away. And it can look on the scan, and indeed, if you look in the nose, as though the things just disappeared. Would you go in and do an endoscopic resection anyway, or would you do some biopsies, or would you just wait? If it looked reasonable on the scan, what would, what would you like to do, Paolo? We had the study with the National Institute of Cancer of Milan, the great experience. And the, the data seems to show that the three-modality treatment had better survival than the B-modality treatment. So perhaps we will have surgery. The, the timing is not well clear, no. but the three-modality treatment seems to be the best option. So I, I must say, I mean, this poor chap, I mean, we, I think we are agreed that this is not a, a curable disease, uh, although Interestingly, he is still alive, but I, he's not alive without disease. Um, and I did chemo radiation followed by uh, endoscopic debulking, and he's suing the hospital and the radiologist, as you might imagine. But I mean, it is interesting if you look in the literature, I mean, A, you've got to be very careful about the diagnosis because these are probably of neuroectodermal origin and can be confused with any number of other tumors if you don't have an experienced pathologist. And in the past, the survival rates were very, very poor. But I think um, my preference and from the literature is to use chemo radiation. And then, irrespective of how it looks, I like to have a look at the cavity under an anesthetic mm -hmm. and to remove 
a substantial amount of tissue as a margin, if only to see whether there's any tumour left there or not. And if it comes back as negative, I say to the patient, be happy. You know, we know there's no further disease. But I think you do have to be uh, very cautious. Any, any other comments on SNOOKS? Because it's very difficult to follow up this kind of patient uh, because the signal on the cyanonasal space after chemoradiotherapy can be very doubtful. Yes. So it's become a nightmare for the patient. Yeah, the lining it's looks terrible, doesn't it? Hmm. So cleaning the tumoid can be a good option and perhaps improve survival. Yeah. Any, any comments or questions on yeah. that? Yes, gentleman at the front here. Wait for the microphone, Mohammed. Much experience with uh, a lot of tumors, but I certainly had one of the SNOCs uh, three and a half years ago and treated with, um, I debulked as much as I can uh, in, the, in the hope that I get a representative uh, biopsy. Um, he presented with um, sudden loss of the eye within one week. Um, and he went for chemo ads and three and a half years so far, there's not a sign of a recurrence. I put him once under general anesthesia, took a couple of biopsies um, just for normal tissue, and I still don't see anything. Uh, but it's, um, it's a very unique tumor, uh, as you can say, and um, I'm not really sure whether would I now go back and open the sinuses and do more, or just wait and see his pits so far and neck are clean. So. We'd, we'd probably wait and see, wouldn't we? Just, no, but just, uh, well, normally, what you expect from the treatment for this disease is that it disappears. They should not stay a block of tissue no. and you say no. it's a scar. Has to it melt. should be nothing. If there is something, there might be tumor, then you, you need to, to check. Gentleman there. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how do you decide on the extent of resection after chemo radiation? If you see the MRIs uh, look normal, do you go for endoscopic radiectomy or uh, just remove the mucosa? It would, it would depend on the case and it would depend on the appearance of the mucosa, but I would do a pretty wide field excision based on the original scan. So the whole of the periphery, I would like to have mucosa that I can look at histologically. Across the skull base and... The that. skull base, I mean, the skull base yes. and the dura? Okay. Well, I wouldn't take the dura necessarily. If the, I mean, if there was tumour that had um, exposed the dura, it's a different <laughs> matter. But, I mean, uh, we're talking about a case where it's melted away and you've got a sort of... Uh, <laughs> Valerie, why would you choose this option of to having chemo radiation first and then yes. surgery, why not surgery before and then the radiation? Well, because for years we did do it that way around. Um, and um, of course, in those days, we were doing more extensive sort of craniofacial type procedures. And it just struck me that if we could do the chemo radiation do the work for us, then it would be a more limited surgical procedure and I could do it endoscopically. But you're absolutely right. There's no, there's no study that shows which one is better to be honest, it's very much your own preference and your own local center. The one they do for esophagus, for instance, for esophagus, they irradiate before they do surgery, while we hardly do it in ENT. Yeah, I know. But, but my question is that if uh, you give chemo rad and if uh, the MRI shows it's normal, you still go and operate on this patient? It depends on how it looks. If it looked completely well healed and normal, then I would just take biopsies from all the way around. If, the, if it looked in any way inflamed, it all goes. Any other questions for the panel? Well, I think, I think the gentlemen have done a fabulous job. Um, I've given them some not tricky questions, <laughs> but, um, cases, but not easy ones either. And they didn't know about any of the cases beforehand. They had no previews in order to think about it. So I think they've done a really, really good job. But I think, you know, we, we, we have obviously tended to opt for the uh, endoscopic approaches here, bearing in mind that there are a number of advantages. Um, but we also have to accept that the, um, there are limitations, they're evolving. We, we don't know how far we can push things. We certainly, um, People are trying, but it's not an either or. You know, we can still combine our endoscopic procedures with um, external procedures. 
Um, I think it's really important to remember the first chance is your best chance of getting the patient cured. And whatever treatment you choose, your, you and your patient are friends for life because these tumours can come back at any time. Um, and as I often say at the end of these sort of lectures, um, what we've been talking about, of course, is what goes on in tertiary referral centres, in hospitals that are well-funded, in very often developed parts of the world. And the fact is that there are lots of patients all over the world who don't have access to these sort of techniques and for whom the conventional techniques are still really important. So with that, I'd like to thank on your behalf our fabulous panel and thank you for staying and enjoy tea.